gets to LA and you start managing, tell us some of the stories. Uh, tell we, us some of the we, exciting. We, yeah, we live down in Santa Monica Canyon and with like 12 of us living this hacienda there and it's only $600 a month back in those days. We we're like two blocks from the beach and uh, we rehearsed in the, you know, in the living room. And we played the Whiskey Go-Go. We became the house band, the Whiskey Go-Go. And we had like Journey open up for us. I mean, it was amazing. We were, we were bigger than a lot of the bands that came through, but we were more like the house band. We still weren't signed yet. And I remember opening up for New York Dolls and uh, gosh, who else? Um, God, gosh, it was, I can't it, There were so many different like journeys, you know, the ones that were coming through the Van Halen's. Now Van Halen was big in LA at the time, but this was back early, early Van Halen before the Sammy Hagar during the Daily Roth days. Well, what were some of the big learning experiences? What are some of the things that maybe you thought, maybe I should have figured this out before? Well, I remember uh, we, uh, uh, Herman, Valentine, uh, Herman Valentine owned the Whiskey A Go Go. He, uh, he called me one day and said, Ron, listen, uh, there's a private party that's going to be at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Can you get your band down there and take all your equipment? I said, well, what's it for? He said, don't, don't worry, Ron, they're going to pay you 100 bucks. I went, hey, we're going to get paid finally. <laughs> you know, we're going to, we went down there and get our $100 and we just, you know, let whatever band was going to play, play with our equipment. They're going to let us play a 15 minute set. So I go down there and it ends up being the share is throwing Dave and Geffen a birthday party. And we had now, all of a sudden, a band that was playing was Bob Dylan in the band. And, we, and we're letting them use all our equipment and I had my band open up for them. And I remember Bill Graham, who was a big promoter at the time, came over to me and with Ahmed Erdogan. God forbid both of them. They were such great guys. They're both passed away now, but they were just wonderful, wonderful people. And they, you know, Bill says, well, Ahmed, you give him a contract and I'll give him, you give him 30000 up front. I'll give him 30 concert days to open up with whatever it could have. It could have been Santana, whoever it might have been at the time that Bill had. Grateful Dead. He had so many, you know, so many great artists that he managed. And uh, I got so excited. And uh, I remember the next morning, Ahmed had invited me back over to the Belleville Hills Hotel to, um, you know, just to, you know, to talk about what was going on. Well, I had, I had already hired this fellow by the name of uh, Herb Cohen, who managed Frank Zappa uh, for a 90 day period for him to try to get us a record deal. Well, as I'm on my way there, I call Herb, and Herb says, Oh, Ahmed and I are best friends, Ron. Don't, don't, let me handle it, buddy. I got it from here. Don't worry about it. You don't even need to go over there. Well, so I just go to Herb's office, and Herb says, Listen, I'm going to go over and see Ahmed for you. Don't worry about it. Well, I don't hear anything for about two or three days. I'm going, Wow, this is really bizarre. I mean, I don't hear my hearing anything from anybody. And it finds out, so I finally call Ahmed back in New York, and Ahmed goes, Hey, I don't know why you said, I asked you to come over. I didn't ask Herb Cohen to come over. And again, our first lesson was, if someone invites you to do something, you do it. You don't send somebody else to do your work for you. We want to hear more. And we will next on It's a Lifestyle. Stay tuned. Begin. You're mine. mine. Chicken. McGruff here. If a bully is bothering you, play it smart and try to talk it out. Or get away and tell an adult. Well done. For more tips, write for my new free comic activity book. Play it smart and help take a fight out of crime. You know, we sing for millions of girls. But helping out schools, that's the real deal, baby. I know our love can multiply, cause you're the X and I'm the Y. I'm the Q one, you know what I'm saying? So, have you ever been backstage before? Okay guys, this is an advocate, an old school calculator. One, two, three, four. Like the circle and the square. Our geometry is a perfect pair. Now why should kids know about gravity? Well, gravity holds them down. I once was one, but now we're two. Uh, I'm spinning out of control. <laughs> Welcome back to It's a Lifestyle. We are talking to Ron Herbert, aka Money Market Ron. You began to manage bands and you managed several bands. So let's talk about how you grew. Well, after uh, Mason broke up, they were original bands, was five years, I'd moved to Los, uh, back from Los Angeles to Virginia Beach because I'd asked the guys, I'd run out of money. I'd gone through all the money I had, my bars had gone down, my guys had left town with the money and I had to sell everything to, you know, to, just to break even. 
So I, I asked the guy, I said, I can't support you guys anymore. I need, you know, we need to go somewhere we're going to make some money. He said, well, we're big in Virginia Beach. So that's how I ended up in Virginia Beach and met Bruce Hornsby. That's another story. But uh, that's, that's how I got to Virginia Beach. And from there, uh, I managed a group called Arrogance, who, uh, well, well, let's go back a little bit. Uh, Snuff was a country rock band that I had. They were great. They were on Curb Records. I got them three record deals through Curb Warners, Curb Electra, and Curb MCA. We had three shots, sold maybe 100,000 albums, just wasn't enough. You know, you had to sell about a half a million records to even be thought about bringing back on. So uh, they broke up, and then I managed a group called Arrogance, where Don Dixon was a bass player of our group, and he, man he ended up leaving the band again, got him a record deal on Warner Brothers. In a two-year period, we put our first album out called Suddenly. They were great. They were like a Bruce Springsteen type. They were just a phenomenal band out of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And Don uh, did a lot of studio work, and he actually produced the first two R.E.M. albums. Wow. Yeah. So it was very, and then, then Island picked up R.E.M. So and Don now is a, a solo artist himself, and he married um, a country star. I can't remember who she was, but he married somebody. So. How do you progress from one band to the other? How, how, what are the goodbyes like? The goodbyes are the worst thing in the world. It's like, it's like your family split up. It's like you lost a family. It's like, it was just awful. But it, each time, I realized that I had to move ahead. And you can't stop from moving ahead. What did you, from the time you started managing bands to this point, what did you see as some of the, the biggest, you know, another great learning takeaway, another great lesson? Well, just that you, you got to trust the people around you. The problem is when you're young, you don't know who to trust. Just like I trust Herb Cohen to take care of my deal with Ahmed Erdogan, it never happened. And I learned that that was a very tough lesson for me. I mean, it cost a lot of money and, and hurt a lot of people's lives. And I learned that uh, you have to take control of your situation and be your own man and do what you have to do to make things happen. Eventually, you went to a convention mm -hmm. and you ran into a guy named Jeff McCluskey. McCluskey, right, out of Chicago. Let's talk about that. I was, at a, I was actually uh, living out of my car at the time. Things had gotten rough. And I, a buddy of mine would let me stay in his extra bedroom. And uh, I knew there was a big record convention up in uh, Washington. I went up there, and the, and the Bobby Poe, who was throwing the convention, had introduced me to Jeff. And Jeff was you know, telling me what he did. He used to work for Columbia Records. He became an independent record promoter. And Bill Graham was his mentor. And Bill was going to help him out. So Jeff wanted to know if I'd want to start working for him in the South. And I said, sure. I mean, you know, I didn't have I, I didn't have anything going. I'd met Bruce Hornsby. I'd done a little work with uh, Bruce a little bit. He just started to cut his first album. And so um, Jeff invited me to be his southern guy, and I was his southern guy. So anyway. Um, what made you decide that maybe you didn't want to continue? I'd already, I'd already, I'd already done like 12 or 13 years doing that. And it was just, I loved it, but it's just, it wasn't profitable. I mean, I, I had to put food on the table. You know, I, I, during that time, I never got married. I mean, I moved so many times, it was just unbelievable. So it was just time for me to finally, you know, it, Jeff was the only person I in my whole life I've ever worked for. I never worked for anybody in my life except myself. So you decided to change paths. Right become a record promoter. Tell us about the very first day. Wow, I remember uh, I was at Bruce Hornsby's uh, signing and uh, he had a, his first, he came back to Virginia Beach. He's from the uh, Williamsburg area, but Virginia Beach, he had a house down there and his family lived there. So we did a in-store with RCA Records. And um, there was a program director that had just started the job at WGH in Norfolk, which at the time was a big top 40 station. And Bruce introduced me to him and I said, yeah, I just started this job with Jeff McCluskey last week. And he said, well, I don't have an independent promoter. You want to be my promoter? And I went, and, and Bruce goes, Ron, you ought to be his promoter. So I became his record promoter and I called Jeff. I said, Jeff, I think I can get us WGH in Norfolk. Well, Jeff was on the airplane that five minutes later and flew down that night to have dinner with us. And he was my, that was, so within the first week, I had my first big, a big account. What were the, what did you see as the bigger differences between the two? Well, they, they had a steady paycheck coming in. That's a nice thing. I mean, I mean, again, you know, when you go to the corporate world, you become, you know, you get just that nice steady paycheck. When you're trying to be an entrepreneur, it's hard. It's very hard to have that paycheck, you know. And so I just knew that it was just nice for me finally, after all those years of struggling, that I finally was going to make some money and I could finally get my life together because I'd give everybody else everything I had. You talk about this lesson of persistence Absolutely. with whatever you do. Tell us about that. Well, if you don't, I'll put it this way, no one else will do it for you. If you don't do it for yourself, I think I've told you this, if you don't do it for yourself, no one else is going to do it. So I just knew I had to 
persevere because my grandfather was, you know, he's, I guess at that time he was probably 89, 90 years old. And my brother had left and he, he moved away and it was just me and my grandpa. And uh, I just didn't want to let him down. So I just had to persevere. I didn't want to ask him for anything. And he was an old man and he, you know, I just didn't want to do that. He was just too good to me as a kid. So I, I, I refused to go to my grandpa and ask him for anything. So I just did what I had to do and became a record promoter. We became the most successful record company, a record promotion company in America. Now, as you continue and become successful, you say that there's a formula that you discovered. What's the well, formula? The, the formula is you have to get a record to play over and over and over to get it sunk into the listener's mind. So the more rotation you got on the record, the bigger your record was. So I learned about how to promote records. We had to break them in the South, maybe break them in the Northeast, maybe break them in Chicago, LA, wherever we could break them at, we'd brought, try to break them. And there's no set formula for a hit record. You know in your gut when you have a hit record. And I was so fortunate that I worked with the, you know, the, the likes of Janet Jackson and the Rolling Stones and Van Halen and Journey. I mean, it was just, what an experience. I mean, just for me to sit there and, and, and I, I was, all of a sudden my dream came alive. So I, you know, I, instead of me managing the band, I was actually the record promoter for the band. So my dream was coming alive in a different kind of way than I ever imagined. What were some of your more exciting experiences with these stars? Wow, I remember Cher. Uh, she was great. Um, still is great. Uh, Tina Turner. Uh, I came back for one of my high school reunions. And I remember she was doing the uh, private dancer. You know, she came in to, to play just for all the people in Atlanta. We were staying at the Ritz Carlton, and we went downstairs, and it was just wonderful. And I remember that I had to go to my 20th year high school reunion. And it was just so cool for me to go in there and just everybody asked me. And I actually had um, Tina's uh, manager hanging a little bit with me, and we we had a ball. It was great. People would see that as the most glamorous position. What were the downfalls? Then, I guess I never got married. I traveled all the time. I, I, I had to stay on top of things. I, my job was to get airplay, but also to take people backstage and introduce them to the bands. And so I had to be on my toes. And the, the bad part is you still have 20 hours, of, you got four hours of work, and you got 20 hours to get wherever you got to get, go to sleep, and all that stuff. And, and rock and roll business is a very, very, very trying business. And so your personal life just took a back seat. Absolutely. I, I, I was driven. I was driven to, to try to succeed. And I just, in my mind, I had a platform to succeed, and I think I did a good, great job for Jeff McCluskey. Ron, what advice would you give someone that would like to follow a similar career path? You know what? You, you have to flow with what's going on. You've got to be true to yourself, be true to your uh, friends. And you never know who your friends are until you, you get into a bind. And then all you can do is be perceptive, you know, just stay on track. Just try to focus, do the job at hand, and just take whatever comes at you with, with, with whatever you can do to make yourself move a little bit further in life. It's just, you know, you learn by experience. And I, I mean, we have so many different experiences, it would take a lot more than a half hour, an hour to even talk about them. Ron Herbert, Money Market Ron, it's been a pleasure. Sure, Gina. Thank you for having me, absolutely. And thank you for joining us here with It's a Lifestyle. If you have someone that you would like to see, you can call me at the number below. You can email me at Gina Woodham at Yahoo. Have faith in your dreams, but most importantly, have faith in yourselves. We'll see you next time.